I actually just inserted this slide after one of the questions from our previous speaker. Uh, I took it, yes, no, yesterday, I was giving a talk in Richmond the day before when I was eating at the food court in Emeryville at the public market. So they have this living wall. Um, and it just speaks to the work that a lot of us do and sort of finding a way to nourish yourself while taking care of others. And again, I think that resonates in this group. Uh, and again, like our former speaker said, that sort of if you find a way, and the way is never an obvious way, but if you find a way to honor yourself and your work, um, it makes a lot of the, the, the small uh, concerns less small, I think, or less big. Um, I just love this. Uh, Daniela and I were both neuroscientists, so we love talking about the brain. Um, and again, we've had dramatically different academic trajectories. Uh, and and it, we were discussing who should go first and who should go second. And on the heels of our previous uh, speaker, it makes sense for me to go first because I'm going to talk sort of at a macro level and really take the time. I, I swear I'm not a narcissist, but I talk about myself a lot. Um, because so much of who, all of who I am is infused in the research that I do, and I work with rats and mice, so think about that for a second, right? Like, I need you to be with me <laughs> to believe the things that I'm about to say. <laughs> and I always think, oh, at some point, uh, you know, I'm going to stop talking about it, the rat and mouse data, but it's the most effective tool I have to sort of transduce a lot of the basic biology back into the hands of people who are in the world and who are going to use it. Uh, and again, my training is, is uh, neuroscience and neurobiology, and I worked as a social worker, and I had a, appointments here in psychology and biology and all those things. And my favorite students on campus are students in the helping professions and disciplines. So my favorite students are students in the Graduate School of Education, clinical psychology students, our joint medical students, uh, our students who are in social welfare. So it's this audience and folks who are willing to learn a little bit of the biology, but I promise you that it will come back to you in spades when you can actually use that um, as an educator or as a counselor, but also uh, the power that it sort of brings at the level, sort of at the personal. Uh, so already I'm going to run out of time for this talk, but it, that's fine. Uh, I promise I'll give you enough info to, to sort of uh, lead you to Daniela. Um, this is an arbitrary title. It, this could be called a lot of different things. Uh, I've worked with primates and, and rats and mice. Uh, and I'm such an animal lover uh, that it's really hard to sort of stress the animal sometimes. And uh, we've done some work now in Berkeley undergrads, and I'm much more comfortable stressing people. <laughs> stressing our Berkeley students than I am stressing our rats and mice. Uh, that's just a qualifier. So uh, I'll talk a bit about me and mostly why I'm convinced we can use animal models to explore these fundamentally human, you know, these very human questions. Uh, and again, on the heels of the last speaker, it's easy to dismiss uh, a lot of the work uh, that we're engaged in because how can we model something so utterly human? We're talking about love and we're talking about support. How can we extract anything useful from rats and mice? And I'm going to convince you that it's possible because I'm convinced and I'm, a, I'm hard to convince. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about stress and how we implicitly just talk about stress and, and again, how we've inherited that perspective uh, and it doesn't have to be. Uh, and mostly I'm going to talk about the developmental programming of the developing stress axis. And let me just say that the stress axis of, of me, of you, of rats, of mice, of mammals um, is, is, is pretty similar across species and across mammalian species. So, oh, I have a loud booming voice normally. Um, so uh, when I talk about our animal model data, uh, your stress axis is no different. Uh, uh, this particular data set, Controlling for Genetics, is really an experiment that I did that mimics uh, the Kamara Jones uh, data looking at the gardener's tail. Uh, and we won't have time for that, but I'll show you the data if you want. And then I'll pass off to Daniela. So this is a picture of me and my sister. And I won't tell you if it's my little sister or my big sister in the picture. Um, and one of us is about three, two and a half or three, and one of us is five or four. We're a year and a half apart. Uh, and if you haven't guessed, this is me. Uh, and despite the fact that I'm standing up here and you're probably making lots of assumptions about who I am and where I come from other than outing myself or out, Coco outing me as Canadian, which you'll hear in about two seconds when I say Z and not Z, or Z and not Z. Um, so I grew up uh, looking like a white kid in a very multicultural family. Uh, my sister and I are a year and a half apart. Uh, and you know, we grew up playing sports and going to ballet and doing all of these things. 
Uh, and everywhere we went, people would look at my sister and ask her if she was adopted. <laughs> everywhere that we went. And this is like nice Canada, right? So, uh, <laughs> this is nice, you know, this is a nice country. Just the, the, the country of Justin Trudeau. <laughs> um, and at some point, and again, this is a post hoc narrative, but at some point, you know, we went through life, our early life together. And at some point, I, I remember seeing the embodiment of just even being asked that, right? And nobody's ever asked me if I was adopted, ever. Um, and, uh, and my sister Byrne, and I can promise you, so, so I should also out myself as saying that I uh, come from an inner city poor neighborhood in Canada, which is very different from America, uh, but really low resourced, um, really poor, everybody is struggling, working class, uh, uh, very diverse uh, community. And my mom has an eighth grade education. Uh, and I should explain the discrepancy in, in sort of skin color that you see. So my father's African American or black, uh, and my mother is First Nations Mi'kmaq, which is sort of Eastern algonquin -y, you know, that part of North America. Um, and my sister happens to look like all the women in my father's family, and I happen to look like all the women in my mother's family. Uh, so um, that explains a little bit of, of that, but um, I was a, a kid who just loved school and loved learning, uh, and I got, because I'm Canadian, I got opportunity, access to great universities. Uh, I'm not in debt. I have no college debt. I remember when I was a grad student uh, at McGill University and, and the tuition went from $800 a year to $1,200 a year and we picketed and re revolted and we won. Like I have no debt. I'm a poor person with no debt from 10 years of university. Um, so it matters, right? So I'm going to talk about these broader social determinants, but it matters that an, I'm an inner city poor kid from a multicultural country in Canada. It matters. It absolutely matters. The opportunity, uh, you know, when my mother was working three jobs, she never had to worry about her kids getting sick and not being able to take them to the doctor because you go to the doctor. I remember when I moved to the U.S. Um, and I kept calling my insurance card my health care card. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you need my health care card. I broke my toe. Here's my health care card. And people are looking at me. Uh, and I'm looking at them going, how is this country this country without health for, you know, health care for everybody? It's another story. Um, but but uh, as a kid who was obsessed with, I really just wanted to understand how I was a white kid in a, and my siblings would call themselves black. Like, I don't, I, you know, the world identifies me as white, uh, but they talk about being black, and I don't. I don't lead with that, for sure. Um, so I kind of wanted to understand uh, why we look so different. And, and I was born in the 70s, and so at that point, of course, the genes are the answer for everything, right? The human genome hadn't been sequenced. Uh, that only happened in the early 2000s, and up until then, uh, we were led to believe that absolutely uh, the answer to every biological, social question we had was genetic differences. Right? So if you're interested in why we're all so different, that we are going to hunt the genes for that, and that there is a gene for every possible complex phenomena you want to describe, there are genes for that. And we spent an awful lot of research dollars, we still do, hunting for genes. Because uh, I promise you it's much easier to swab your cheek and sequence your DNA than it is to unpack your life history <laughs> or your life course. Um, but I'm going to convince you that with rats and mice we can do it. I swear we'll get beyond five slides. Uh, so my personal experiences absolutely inform my research questions and program. So when I was an undergraduate, uh, I was a genetics major, and then I was a biochemistry major. And if you cared about people and health, and you were sort of in the science, you know, in the science perspective, that of course you were going to go to med school. Um, and then I started taking those classes, and they were absolutely not satisfying at all because what we were studying is much more focused and reduced. And my experiences, I knew, were, were broader, right? I knew that this broader, these broader experiences were influencing uh, who I am. So at some point, I took an intro psychology course, fell in love with neuroscience, and then that was it, right? So the brain was sort of the most exciting thing to me. Uh, so my research really, uh, in the most simple, basic way, uh, unpacks how our different environments, context, experiences influence who you are and developmentally who you become. So there's nothing fancy or complicated at all. And I keep, uh, you know, I'm always listening to people give nice introductions because to me these experiments are the most simple, obvious experiments to do, but yet nobody's doing them and nobody is asking the questions that matter most to me, and I think a lot of the time it's because people like me or people like us are not represented you know, in all the rooms and places and spaces. So that's my plug for you know, do you uh, in your space. 
because if not you, then who? Um, and then ultimately, where is the hope and how, how can we affect change? Uh, this is one of my favorite graphs. There's no time to talk about it here, but trying to understand. So I'm absolutely uh, uh, interested in the experiences of racism, not race as a genetic construct, but racism as an experienced phenomena. And I can say to this group that, well, to all groups, but that my experience of racism is through my siblings and my mother. Absolutely, the world treats me like a white woman. Uh, and I'm in lots of environments where people are looking at me going, you know, the things coming out of this white woman's mouth, not knowing what my, uh, my background is, for sure. Um, but this phenomenon is absolutely uh, compelling to me. And again, being in this country, uh, and it's looking at just the, it's an American sample looking at the percentage of adults with fair or poor health, y-axis, x-axis is just where you fall with economically with respect to the federal poverty level. What's not surprising is that if you uh, are living below the poverty level, that you have the worst, poorest health outcomes or prognoses. Also, maybe not surprising that if you're uh, in the wealthiest in this uh, 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 sample, that you actually have the best or are the most robust or healthy. But the, the stepwise gradient relationship um, is what's so telling to me. And again, that's not to discount racial or ethnic differences, but uh, this SES differences, right? So. Um, it matters if you're not poor, but it matters if you're almost uh, uh, in the top end of this distribution. And in the US, this slope is ridiculously steep. And this function and this relationship exists in all, in all Western countries, but um, it's less steep. So for example, in Canada, um, you see this relationship, but um, it's not nearly as dramatic as it is here. So something to think about that it almost doesn't matter where, when you're wealthy where you're born in the world, but it always matters where you're poor and born in the world. So think about that, like the differences between Canada and the US. And I'm only here because I'm Canadian, given uh, the opportunities that I had versus what I wouldn't have here. Uh, I came to Berkeley uh, with a split appointment, actually with psycho psychology, neuroscience, and public health. And I've gone all in uh, with public health only because this perspective was what I didn't, was what I had been searching for, but I didn't know existed. Uh, and it's really the so social epidemiological perspective, which is that we can't just look at individuals out of context. Uh, that we need, to, we need to understand who our people are um, and how that informs who we become. Uh, so I'm going to go through this just quickly. And again, this social epi perspective, just that context is everything. And from a neuroscience perspective and from a, from a medical perspective, we study individuals uh, typically decontextualized, right? So we study individual brains or individual uh, behaviors, but really we know that our social place in the world is dictating um, just about everything that we would care to predict. Uh, it was interesting being a Canadian, again, I, maybe I am a narcissist talking about myself, but being a Canadian moving here at age 30, I never had to identify race. I, I, I didn't have to check a box ever, and I upset people here by not being willing to check a box. Um, and then some of the discussions I had in my postdoc, um, and I'd never been exposed, and again, as a sort of inner city poor kid, I'd never been judged for being poor. I had never, it had never crossed my mind, like we're all in it, life is hard, like it less or, or more hard for some of us. Uh, and then this, this, I met Republicans for the first time at age 30. <laughs> And, and this is really what, that, that, this at age 30, as a grown-up, as a grown-ass woman, this is the first time that I had encountered this notion that, oh, people think poverty is a choice. Like, people think that kids are choosing, like, and I, I'm not even making a joke. Like, this is, I had these discussions. I happened to be at Emory University, which is very white, very wealthy. Uh, so I, I, you know, I was arguing with 22-year-olds <laughs> about them managing their money, and I'm like, it's not your money. You inherited that money. You inherited that privilege. Uh, and I, I mean, I just sort of cognitively had to kind of get with the program of life in this country. It was like I was amazed that I had never had this thought as a poor kid growing up inner city with a mom, you know, with an eighth grade education that had never been held against me, that I've never been judged for, for that. So this phenomena was, uh, you know, uh, revelatory for me. And again, I, I, the previous speaker mentioned Len Syme, who's also one of my favorite people on the planet. Uh, I was traveling and giving talks about the basic research and I got exposed to these different disciplines. Uh, and I got so excited realizing that we were all asking similar questions from different perspectives. But I was, I was most entranced with this social epidemiological perspective. Um, 
And again, my take home from, from reading this uh, body of literature is that the single most powerful predictor of health and well-being is your social place in the world. And I'm going to let you define what your social place is. So that can be the color of your skin, that can be the zip code of the neighborhood or postal code. American, what do you say, zip code? Zip code? I don't know, I'm losing, yeah, for a second. Uh, the, the neighborhood that you live in, uh, whether you were raised in a two-parent family, um, what your income is. So, so I'll let you define your social place in the world and we can uh, measure objective data and plot that relative to outcomes. Uh, and have real, you know high level of predictability, but more powerful than that is your implicit response to this. So where you place yourself in your hierarchy is more powerfully predictive than any objective measure. So again, that's sort of looking at the transduction of all these broader social determinants sitting at the level of the individual, right? And so this is when we're deciding the order when to speak, this makes perfect sense for sort of me to introduce the animal model work because it's the confluence of broader determinants still acting at the level of the individual, still being somaticized or embodied uh, into biological vulnerability, biological risk, or biological resiliency. Uh, but you can see, hopefully, I'll show you, if I don't run out of time, um, sort of those proximate pathways via which that happens. And again, these are all of our lived experiences, right? But a lot of the basic research, we strip away context, we strip away uh, environments, and we isolate all of these variables, and life is not like that at all. And we're here uh, in Berkeley, and we talk a lot, especially in, two, in, in 2017, about intersectionality. Um, and that's certainly not represented in basic research uh, at any space. Uh, so this is, uh, these are data sets that are probably familiar to a lot of you as counselors and educators, but it's what I found trying to counter that uh, poor people make poor decisions and you're sick and not well and stupid and poor because of a lifetime of poor judgment and decision making, right? Like shame on you that you should do better. So this is data from kids showing the same SES gradient. Uh, and again, so these are children uh, and the lowest SES uh, kids have the highest uh, prevalence of health problems across a spectrum. Uh, of diseases or disordered. Um, Daniela will talk a little bit about or, or the stress hormone cortisol, <laughs> primary stress hormone, uh, and again, stratified by SES. So by age six, the game is afoot, right? So kids who are growing up in different economic circumstances have different basal levels of the stress hormone. By age eight and then by age 10, not surprisingly, the poorest kids have the highest stress hormone. So that's not a lifetime of smoking and drinking. Like, let me just leave you with that. Uh, but yet that was the, that's the argument that people make, right? Like that poor people get what they deserve. And why can't they save money for healthcare? Because <laughs> all that extra money we all have floating around. It's ridiculous. Um, I can't, again, my, my uh, paperwork for my green card is being processed now, so I have to be very careful. No. <laughs> Don't get me started. Uh, but it's, in, it's incredible to, to be living in this country and, and have discussions with grown-ups. And, you know, at this level, who absolutely believe that poor people choose poverty and get what they deserve, including those children, including those five or six-year-olds, who already are uh, presenting with chronic illness or, or uh, precursors to chronic illness. Um, so thinking about, uh, uh, I teach a graduate course called Biological Embedding of Social Factors, so some of my favorite students are here. Uh, and the best part about that class are, are this, the heterogeneity of the students, so students from education, uh, psych, med school. Um, and so a lot of what we're talking about with respect to uh, these health effects also play out with academic achievement. And again, as educators, you see that, right? So you know, uh, and, and so this is just a way to demonstrate that the game is afoot, again, with respect to cognitive processes that then play out and track with academic achievement. Uh, Pre-verbal, which is pre-16 months, this is just looking at complexity of vocabulary growth. By two years old, you see the, the stratification by uh, a parental income or profession, and then by 36 months, these uh, differences are already exaggerated, and this is before kids even show up at kindergarten. So another phrase that uh, was in my face when I moved to America was all things being equal, and I don't know in what <laughs> universe that, I mean, how, you know, you want to tell a kindergartner all things being equal, but by 36 months of age, things are very unequal. Uh, uh, and if you look at uh, cumulative uh, difference in language exposure by three years of age, again, stratified by low, mid, high SES, 
uh, and the, the volume and complexity of words that kids have been exposed to. And again, these are powerful predictors of academic achievement. So the game is afoot at 30 spike uh, two years or three years. Um, but talking to your kids is free, right? That shouldn't cost anything. So this is just to seed your thinking about the power of these early developmental experiences. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And I'll go through this quickly, and again, Gabby can provide the slides. Uh, and this is just looking at a spectrum of adversity experienced in early childhood, so sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, partner violence, all the bad stuff, a lot of the bad stuff, um, and looking at the exposure incidence of this in a large sample size, uh, and then uh, looking at uh, uh, different dimensions of outcomes, uh, physiological, behavioral, cognitive, social, emotional, in response to adversity uh, early in life. And not surprisingly that these, the uh, greater the number of uh, adverse experiences early in life, the greater the developmental delays, uh, the uh, greater the risk for adult depression. And again, this is early life playing out uh, uh, over, the, over the life course. Uh, and again, like, sort of thinking about the potency and the power of these, this early developmental window um, to really create these trajectories that are just going to play out. Uh, and again, that's what we get to explore with our animal model. So hopefully you convince you that adversity early in life influences a lot of different things. Why is early life such a vulnerable time point? Uh, and then how do we establish a causal link between early adversity and then some of the biological stuff? Um, so there are lots of folks on this campus uh, who are engaged in, uh, in health disparities research uh, really focused on uh, uh, or, or early life development. Um, and the utility, I think, of the, the greatest usefulness of those of us working with animal models, uh, we get to unpack the how, right? So the transduction of these lived experiences into a biological uh, signal or residue. So I have five minutes, we'll get, to, I swear I'll show you some data. Uh, so how does the information from the environment become biologically embedded? Uh, and again, so Danielle, so I'm sort of really taking time to convince you that these lived experiences, and then I can leave you to define what those experiences have been for you, but how those influence the development and calibration of the stress axis, which then actually puts us on these different trajectories for differential vulnerability to uh, various outcomes. So how does the environment become biologically uh, embedded? So again, Daniela is going to talk specifically about stress in the brain and stress, uh, stress in general. Uh, and again, on the heels of the previous speaker, I probably don't have to unpack chronic stressors or allostatic load at all. Um, and just thinking about how, the, so, so thinking about how some of these proximate pathways can play out at the level of the individual, and how we can work from these broader determinants to, you know, a, a kid sitting in class. Um, and so this is happens to look at uh, family SES, but you can, again, use the ex example of growing up in Canada versus growing up in the US, inner city poor mom uh, with lots of social resources and lots of social support versus uh, growing up here. And in a lot of our classes, we have discussions about you know, what's worse, the Iron Triangle in Richmond or East Oakland or you know, the latest murder rates. Um, you know, that's fantastical to me as a Canadian, uh, just completely different levels of stress. Uh, but again, that these are very proximate pathways that get you from these broader macro forces to uh, at individual level um, vulnerability. So uh, historically, lots of people have been interested in uh, early experiences as they uh, differentially influence the stress axis. Uh, people have been studying this for many, many years. Uh, I like this because it, uh, again, identifies the idea that we want to understand why uh, individual level variability sort of comes to be. And again, like I opened with uh, the HPA or stress axis between our rodent models and, and uh, uh, primates is, is pretty robust and talking about rats and mice, similar. So typically, depending on which academic trajectory you've taken, if you've come from a more social background, we spend a lot of time focusing on this. And if you come from a bio biology or genetic background, we spend a lot of time focusing on this. And as a, bi as a genetics major, uh, we controlled E. We controlled environment, right? <laughs> Which is where, the, where all the activity is to, to quantify and study G. Uh, the model, the diathesis model of stress, the idea 
Uh, the implicit uh, approach is that there's a, there's a presumed biological vulnerability. Life happens that reveals this vulnerability and then you get compromised phenotypes. So there's an inherent directionality that that uh, variability is biological and pre-existing, right? So that's a very deterministic, the, sort of the gene-centric view of life and living, which implicitly we were all taught whether we realized it or not. So nature nurture, G by E, environments, and all of the work that I'm engaged in is looking at how vulnerable experiences are creating that biological vulnerability. So it's the most fundamental inversion of that relationship, but it matters. It matters if you think that uh, this vulnerability is being created by something that you experience or something that you inherit. And again, uh, you'll still encounter this very gene-centric view of pathology in lots of different environments. Um, so I'm going to show you one example from uh, our rat data that uh, uh, highlights the sort of the ability to, to use these animal models to identify mechanisms of transduction. So we know crappy stuff happens to you early in life and that affects uh, the quality of life later. So what does somebody like me have to offer? We know that somehow the stress axis is involved. Uh, again, depending on your background or history, the, the history of the developmental models that I've worked with kind of have two independent but very complementary pathways. One is this Freudian psychoanalytic perspective that harsh things happen to you early in life that affect later adult levels. And then the Harlow data, which is all the monkey attachment theory. So that's what's informed the rodent work. And so uh, for one of my favorite studies, uh, and I have these slides for other data if we have time after, uh, but I want to show you data from this particular study looking at the non-genomic transmission across gener uh, generations of maternal behavior and stress responses in the rat. So uh, we know that events that happen early in life matter and that they influence who you become and who you are uh, until you die for the most part. Uh, and people have been working with these models but nobody could identify what exactly was going on. So we spent a lot of time observing within litter uh, parameters and variables and it turns out that this particular behavior, the tactile stimulation or the active uh, parenting profile um, was the most powerful predictor of later uh, stress axis functioning. Uh, so all of our, we looked at hundreds uh, of rat mothers with their offspring. Uh, they were all maternal but they were uh, different, there was a differential distribution of the percentage of active parenting or active maternal care. This is brain stuff that Daniela will talk about, but just to say that the quality of early life uh, uh, maternal care absolutely influenced the development of brain regions that are implicated in uh, fear and anxiety and, and uh, frontal cortex function, um, stress hormone, cortisol in people. So the, the quality of those early life interactions are dictating what we're measuring in these animals as adults. Um, I really am obsessed with behavior, so this is just one example of an open field. So animals who are fearful or anxious are not going to explore a novel environment. Uh, and then uh, offspring who have these differential early experiences have dramatically different exploration profiles. Uh, and again, I worked with exotic uh, rats as a graduate student. When I started my postdoc, I was at a primate colony and I spent six months just watching uh, rhesus macaque mothers with their, with their offspring. And it was this effect manifest. So of, of this uh, rhesus macaque mother, the child was with the mother, the child was not exploring, the child was not learning and living and growing, the, the child was absolutely always on mom. Um, the child of these uh, dominant uh, rhesus macaque mothers were assholes, <laughs> they were running around, they, the world was theirs, that they had the quality of life of the, of, of the offspring based on maternal rearing was absolutely insane. Uh, and it's seeing this play out. Stress hormone profiles, thinking about our, our previous speaker. And again, uh, the power of our lived experiences, right? So talking about growing up inner city poor and the chronic unremittent uh, stressor exposures, which are common to many of us. So these, in a rat world, uh, we can stress the animals for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, and then I can measure, so we can measure stress hormone levels, and this is just the difference in exposure to stress hormone from a single stressor. So take this magnitude and uh, look at it across a lifetime. So every time I'm stressed, 
I mount this ridiculously high incredible stress response versus somebody else who might have a very uh, attenuated, you want a stress response, you want it to uh, do what it needs to do and you want it to turn off. So if you're a product of these low looking and grooming environments, your stress response comes on, it takes a really long time to recover. So think about that uh, over and over and over. I'm gonna show two more slides and then pass it off to Daniela. So uh, a lot of that work is proof in principle about sort of some of the experiences that I had had, but the question becomes how do we affect change, right? So, uh, so I did the very, designed the very obvious experiment. So I took, so thinking about this nature and nurture perspective, uh, and the prediction is that if this is a genetic effect, that it shouldn't matter if I muck around with environments, um, that the mother that you're born to, environment, uh, any of these things that I'm trying to convince you matter. Uh, so I did, I took pups from characterized higher low looking and grooming environments and then I cross fostered them. Uh, it's a, it was a long study, I'm making it short and quick. Um, so thinking about the control groups, the high versus low in this measure of uh, open field behavior. Um, notice this group, so these, this was, a, I, did a, I did a cross fostering in, a, in the foundation population and then I actually looked at the behavior of the daughters and then the granddaughters. So this is an effect across two generations of cross fostering uh, with grandmothers. So this is a non-genomic effect that's being persisted, that, that's being transmitted across two generations. So if the argument were that this, these were genes that were driving this, this would not be the case. And again, just to show you one brain measure, um, the part of the brain called the hippocampus, and, and this visual is so powerful because you can see how impoverished this brain is, right? With respect to expression of receptors that are so important for regulating the stress axis. Uh, so this is the low control, impoverished, vulnerable population, high control, but look at the low cross foster granddaughters from an intervention that we in, in, imposed two generations before. So this uh, environmental intervention persisted across two generations and it popped up with respect to uh, our behavioral measures, our stress hormone levels, and at the level of the brain. So the power, again, of our differential lived experiences to drive our biology and to drive our responses to stress. So this is just a nice way of looking at uh, the again, from a life course perspective, how these uh, early adversities uh, can readily compound and often life doesn't get better. Life stays pretty crappy for a lot of us. Um, and then the, the, the consequences, the physiological and the medical consequences of that. Uh, this is the thank you slide. And again, the people that I have spent the most time talking with are Len Sang, who's this uh, a social epidemiologist and then Daniela who uh, we talk about the brain stuff um, but sort of you can see how the, the, the way that I designed these experiments is really the intersection of both of those and so I hope that I've convinced you uh, that we can use these animal models in really informed ways to, uh, to, to extract useful data for us living in the world. Good? Well, as an adolescent medicine doc, I think of myself as being in the geriatrics of pediatrics. And uh, I want to say I'm, I'm very happy that this work is continuing in a way to show that this plasticity uh, exists uh, later on in life in the geriatrics of pediatrics, in uh, late adolescence and young adulthood and later. And uh, one of the people who's helping to really show this work across the life course is uh, Dr. Kaufer, or Daniela. And she, as you will hear from her lovely accent, was born and raised in Israel and completed her bachelor's and her PhD at uh, Technion and Hebrew University and moved here for a postdoc. No doubt, like me, when I moved to California, I probably told her family she was just gonna come here for a postdoc. And lo and behold, she's still here um, and joined the faculty in integrative biology and neuroscience. And so her, her work focuses on the kind of work that Danielle is talking about um, in the brain, looking at stress and plasticity and the idea that stress can affect brain function and lead to kind of the two aspects. Though We separate out psychiatric outcomes and neurologic outcomes even though they all come out of the same organ. 
Why do we do that? I don't know. Um, anyway, so she's looking at these outcomes from that same organ, mental health, as well as epilepsy, in some people while other people uh, thrive. Um, and when she's not doing all this amazing work and publishing in all these amazing journals, she's taking care of her own stress reactivity by reading and doing yoga and meditating and hanging out with her family. So, Toda Raba for being with us, Dr. K. Lovely introduction, as Darlene just said. This, I think, might be the first time that anybody ever said that an Israeli accent is lovely. <laughs> I whispered that. <laughs> yeah, but I agree. I don't think I was ever told that. Um, yes, and it's. It, and so does your accent. <laughs> I worked on it for 28 years before moving to California, on my Israeli accent. Um, and it's actually, it's really an honor to be here and. This is the part that's most important about the work, to me, is we, we sit in a lab and we study mice and rats and we get all this notions about the world and ideas about how things work and if it doesn't go out to the people that are really in the world and doing the work, it doesn't mean anything. So I'm very, very excited to share it with you and that's exactly what we're going to do now is take all this information that you got in the last few hours and I'm going to try to give you the biology of it. That's, that's what my lab does, is taking those big ideas and trying to find the actual molecular processes that are behind it. So it's very basic world, but it is informed by the world, and I think this is the way to convince people that those things work, right? It's uh, go beyond the epidemiology and say, and here is how that happens, and here is how this is actual biology. We're not talking about choices. We're not talking about... Um, it's all in your head. The, the lab, um, so I've been at Berkeley now for about 12 years and a professor of neuroscience and physiology. My lab studies, uh, the, this process is across the lifespan. This is uh, my own teenage daughter. So now I got very interested in teenagers and <laughs> adolescents and their uh, slew of ideas. But we're looking at from a very young, uh, we, there's a lot of work that we are not doing that look at in utero development. We are starting from the moment that the organism is born, early life, uh, toddler years, adolescent years, and adulthood. And we've now extended that and started asking questions about the aging brain as well. And you'll see that all across that spectrum, there are trajectories. And we can look at those trajectories. And, and aging and the successful aging seems to also track back to a lot of that. We're looking at social, emotional, and cognitive measures in those rats and in the mice. Sometimes we use rats, sometimes mice, depending on uh, what we can do. Rats are so much smarter than the mice, and so for behavior, that's always a choice. Uh, mice genetics are easier to manipulate, so a lot of times when we're trying to manipulate a specific gene, there are models in mice that are easier for us to study. And then we do take that into pathology and injury, and we're looking at traumatic brain injury, and we're looking at epilepsy. And I want to say that I'm not talking about this today, but happy to answer any questions about that um, with you guys. Just to, uh, get to, to not take credit for things I didn't do myself, this is the work of many, many students and collaborators uh, that I'm showing today. And of course, nothing can be done without the funding. I want to start by telling you the biology of the stress response is that sitting in a day like this, thinking about what we're thinking today, we're really sort of forgetting possibly one very crucial part, which is the stress response is vital. It's crucial. You have to have a stress response to survive, right? So we're not talking about the evil stress response. Let's figure out how to take it away, because if we take it away from rodents, for instance, the next time that the veterinary assistants come in and want to change their cages, half of them are dead because they weren't able to handle the stress of the cage change. So the stress response is vital. It's important. You have to have it to survive. Right? It is something that is there to help you in traumatic situation and in chronic situations and actually day to day. So. Waking up in the morning, there is a stress response. We talked a lot about the cortisol. There's a rise in your cortisol every day right before you wake up, and it's actually responsible for the fact that you are woken up and you can go on your daily activities. When it's really elevated, and it's elevated across the uh, 
different times and different responses, like Darlene just showed you, like um, you saw earlier today, that's a problem, right? Then we'll start seeing maybe troubles falling asleep, maybe other troubles that we'll talk about. So there are parts to the response that are physiological and crucial and important, and there are parts to the response where it doesn't work as it should that could be detrimental. Um, you've heard already about adrenaline. So adrenaline and noradrenaline are right here. This is the part of the autonomic nervous system that gets activated with stress. So uh, there's a stress response. The autonomic nervous system gets activated. It actually sort of shifts from one mode to another mode. One mode is called the, the parasympathetic mode. It's also called rest and digest. And the active mode you might know as fight or flight would be, I think I actually have it here, fight or flight would be the sympathetic mode. Everything gets activated, everything gets ready to handle something, for instance, a lion that's gonna run after you or any other stressor that comes around, right? And so the whole response is there to get the organism to deal with whatever it's coming. So you need that heart to go faster, you need to breathe faster, you need to send blood specifically to your muscles, to your heart, to your brain, you kind of don't need other things. You may not worry about digestion right now. So there's a decrease in digestion in the enzymes and the intervention to it in the uh, peristaltic movement. Other things not really important, maybe reproduction. Let's not worry about reproduction right now. Very urgent things are going on. So there's a decrease in reproduction. We studied that in another part of the lab and in collaboration with friends of ours where we show that stress, what are the molecular steps in which stress would inhibit reproduction? On an acute life term, this is very important, right? You need to not worry about reproduction when you're doing something else. Now imagine this goes on for very long, that means reproductive problems for a chronic stressed individual, for instance. Within that, adrenaline and noradrenaline that are secreted from the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is this little gland sitting on top of your kidneys. You have one of each side, they're sitting on the kidneys and they have two types of cells. One type of cell will release adrenaline and noradrenaline, the other type of the cell would release cortisol that we heard about. And together, they orchestrate the stress response. At the same time that this happens, this is very quickly. This is a neuronal response, neurons fire, and you have this response very quickly. There's a slower response that takes minutes, which is the endocrine response. The endocrine response goes through this axis, HPA axis that you've already heard today, the term, means the hypothalamus in the brain, the pituitary, and the adrenal gland, HPA. That axis gets activated. There's a series of hormones that are now released from the HPA, there's a hormone. That hormone gets to the pituitary, triggers the release of another hormone. That hormones get released, sent all the way across the body, gets to the adrenal gland, and makes the release of cortisol. So some minutes after the stress occurred, so immediately you're going to see adrenaline shoot up, noradrenaline shoot up. Some minutes after that, cortisol is going to be produced and released to the bloodstream. This hormone, cortisol, released to the bloodstream and goes around and it'll get to any cell in your body. Now, which are the cells that respond? That depends on the receptor. Receptor would be the molecule, the protein, that is built to see that one molecule. They're the right fit for that molecule. So for cortisol, we have two different receptors. For adrenaline, we have two different receptors. Noradrenaline, other receptors. The cells that are gonna to respond to cortisol are the cells that have the receptor for cortisol. Turns out, and then cells in our body have different expression of different receptors. If I were to look at the kidney cell, a muscle cell, a heart cell, a brain cell, they all have different receptors that they express, which means this is what they're responding to. What about cortisol? Turns out, each and every cell in your body has a receptor for cortisol. Some of them have the receptor for all three hormones that we're talking about. There isn't a single cell that does not have the receptor for cortisol. Some years ago, about 15 years ago, one of our very esteemed colleagues from Princeton put out a paper about a, a cell type that I will tell you about today, some stem cell, very exciting stem cell that we found in the brain, and said this is the one cell that does not have a cortisol receptor. It, doesn't, it does not at all work for that. 
And then it turned out she wasn't, there, there was some mistake in the way that she was quantifying. Of course, the cell has that. So we do not know of today a single cell that doesn't. And that tells you about how widespread that response is. All the cells in your body respond to a stress response, to a change in the cortisol level. So of course it's gonna be something that affects everything, right? It affects health and all those different levels that Arlene just showed you because it really affects the whole organism, every cell in us. And as you already heard, allostasis and allostatic load are important concepts in that, right? And so it's a good response, it's an important response when there's some of it. When there's a lot of it, there is wear and tear to the system in a lot of different levels. And because every cell in our body responds to it, we're gonna see a lot of those effects. We'll see immune suppression and reproductive suppression and digestive tract um, problems like ulcers, stunted growth, cardiovascular problems, blood pressure problems, um, osteoporosis, metabolism, diabetes, accelerated aging on the cellular level, right? You just heard about how those women have an accelerated age. This is something that you can see with cortisol. And most importantly to what we're gonna talk about today, the brain. The brain is a hub of responses to the stress. The brain is full of those stress receptors. The picture that you've just seen from Darlene is something that shows you all of those receptors in the brain. So some areas have a lot of it, some less, every cell has it. In the cortex, we see a lot of the stress receptors in uh, different areas and the most of it we see in the prefrontal cortex, that area of the cortex that is important for executive decisions. So we're gonna see impairment of executive function with exposure to stress, to chronic stress, to traumatic stress. What that means to people, it'll be decreases in verbal calculus, decision making, right? Take it back to the talk in the morning, take it back to students in the classroom. I could argue that those are a little bit important for function in the classroom, okay? There's exacerbated neuronal death following a lot of neurological insults, meaning the way that your brain and your cells, at the level of the cells, is able to deal with any other insult that comes along is hampered. So if a traumatic brain injury comes along, but you're in a chronic stress, different outcome. If concussions comes along, you're a football player, let's say, different outcome, right? Epilepsy looks different. If there was a stroke for an aging individual on a background of chronic stress, there is much greater susceptibility of the cells to that. When we look into other areas of the brain, there's that area that you looked at right now, the hippocampus. That area is very, very enriched in, in the glucocorticoid receptor, in that receptor for the stress hormone. And this is an area that is very important for learning and memory. And it is much inhibited by the stress. There's a huge difference in stress there. There is uh, an impairment of memory, impairment of learning, and there's increase of incidence of depression and psychopathologies that seem to be important um, in involving that area. So overall, when we look at it, there's gonna be emotional symptoms, there's gonna be cognitive symptoms, there's gonna be social symptoms. I'll talk a little bit about those. There's social withdrawal that uh, the chronic stress shows in our rodents, and there are long-term effects. Long-term effects would be things like anxiety, depression, panic attacks, and in its extreme post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't know if we have time to talk about that today, but there's a lot to say about that that we could, uh, questions and answers or whatever. The activation of the stress response, even in animal models, even when we look at the rodents, is really dependent on environment, right? So this is not genetics. This is not a set in stone. There is a, a stress response and it's always gonna look the same. It depends on whether they were eating and drinking beforehand. It depends on whether they have access to food and drink right after the stress response. It depends on physical activity and physical activity seems to really counteract stress effects. You can stress a rat and let them then run on a running wheel and the stress effects disappear. So that's a big, uh, difference in that. The sleep patterns are very important to that. Did they, let them, did they sleep well before? Did they sleep well after? And the stress is going to be different. Their social environment, uh, social support, and I'll show you some data about that, and sadly displacement of aggression. If you stress a rat and then you put them in a cage and there's a smaller rat in there and they can beat up on that smaller rat, 
that is one way to ameliorate the stress reaction. Maybe not the way that any of us want to think about, but that tells you that social context matters. Social support also does something very similar to that. And then sense of control, which we all sort of understand, but imagine that for a rat. So if a rat has a lever there and they press the lever and think that they have a control over the stressor versus a rat that has a lever, presses it, gets exactly the same amount of stress, but they don't control it, they will show a physiological difference, right? There's going to be a difference in the hormone, in the neurotransmitter, in the physiology of the brain if the rat has control over it. And then having control for all of that, there's still individual variability. We still see differences. We can take genetically sort of identical animals and give them the same environment and give them the st same stressor and there's going to be a range of responses. Some of them are resilient and are going to do just fine and some of them are going to show a lot of differences. And that allows us to ask very, very meaningful questions. That really lets us now unpack the biology of how that happens. So I'm going to give you one example for how we do that. Um, it's important to, to explain that in the context of understanding brain development, right? So when we start with brain development, all of our cells in the brain as an embryo would start being a stem cell. The stem cell can uh, differentiate into, it, it proliferates, it makes more of itself, and then it can differentiate into being different types of cells. Neurons versus glia, the support cell, other cells. And then about 50 or 70% of the cells die, depending on which one connected, and now you have your mature brain. And for many, many years, the central dogma was just, I'll tell you, this is it. What you have when you're born is what you're going to have when you die, except for what dies in the middle because you drank too much alcohol. So it's fixed. This is the central dogma of neuroscience comes from this uh, brilliant person who found out what was right for his time, but said once development was ended, growth and regeneration of dendrites dried up irrevocably, the nerve paths are fixed, immutable, everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. Optimism at its best. <laughs> but, but you immediately can tell that this is not exactly true, right? The brain is plastic. You all know people who got stroke, right? And maybe they were paralyzed or they couldn't speak. And then some months later, they can do that. When I have more time, I sometimes show a video here of a, um, a friend of mine, Canadian friend of mine, who has a cat who had a, an injury and a leg was taken off, and then the cat learned to walk again, and you can't even tell. So there's plasticity. There is some change in the brain where it adapts. We learn. We learn all the time. You're learning right now. Your brain's going to look a little bit different when you leave that room because there are different connections that were made, right? So it's very clear that there is plasticity. And where does that sit in the brain? We also know... Uh, that plasticity drops across the lifespan, and so it's very, very high in the beginning, and across the lifespan it drops. Not a, not, not a happy thought when you're my age. However, you see that it does not drop to zero, so it continues throughout the lifespan. We know that there are critical periods of plasticity. There are times where our brain is much more susceptible to different kind of cues. Whoever is working with youth will know that social cues are very, very important to that age, less so than they are beforehand, right? for instance. The teen brain is a little bit different. Lack of time, we're not going to talk about that now, and it was mentioned before, so I'll jump into the actual now cells, right? So we're talking about the cells. Where does that plasticity lie? Where is that? So one thing is the connections between cells. This is called the synapse. Two cells are connecting to one another and talking to one another. This is a synapse. They can change. They can change the, uh, how, how strong they talk to one another. They can change whether there's a connection there at all or not, or they might actually change completely that tree that that cell is, the neuron is, meaning what cells do they connect to or not. And we already know that that happens in stress. So we know that given a chronic stress, there's going to be a difference in the connections between different cells, how strong they connect to one another in the, in the hippocampus. When you apply chronic stress, there's a decrease in that. The, the hippocampus is not as plastic to learn new things. When you apply stress, we see a difference in the amount of those connections, and even we see a difference in the cell morphology. So that's very, very profound, right? The cells actually look different in the brain of a mouse 
that was stressed here for seven days. Seven days of stress, and look at how much this cell shrunk. And that's in an area of the brain that's critical for learning and memory. And so it is clear that from that, we will get deficits in learning and memory. If you look at another area of the brain, the amygdala, this is an area of the brain that's important for fear and for threat. There, the cells are going to be bigger. So it's not overall everything shrinks. Some areas get stronger, and those are areas that are responsive to fear and threat that will explain to you why you might see a difference in the response afterwards. But the most sort of mind-blowing thing of all of this to me was that actually this whole story about cells are not born in the brain, that's not true. That's true for most of the brain, but there are pockets, there are tiny little places in the brain where cells are being generated throughout life. And one of them is the hippocampus. And we already know that the hippocampus is so important. It's important for activating the HPA axis. It's important for depression. It's important for learning, for memory. And there is a population of cells in that area of the brain that is stem cell population and continuously makes more neurons. It makes more neurons, and those neurons mature. And it's not a lot. You can see that if you're a, new, a, a newborn or during development, there's going to be a quarter of a million neurons that are born for, per minute. If you're an adult, right now, your brain is going to create something about 700 to 1,000 neurons throughout today. Okay? So that's not a lot. But they're very important. And turns out that they're important for specific things. They're very, very important for pattern separation, for high level, for high level of learning, for specific learning of details. So you teach a mouse to do something that's pretty simple, they can do it without those cells. You ask them to do something that is more complex, there's more details to it, they're not able to do that without those cells, even though they're not a lot. It is very important for the regulation of this HPA axis. So they're going to play a role in deciding how much of a stress response do you have. And they're crucial for antidepressants. When you give mouse antidepressant, they do not work unless this population of cells is there. And they're important in remembering fear-associated contexts. So they put together this information from the amygdala and the hippocampus, and your responses to fear involve the activation of those cells. And then, turns out those cells are also very heavily regulated. They're not always the same. They're things that push up the proliferation of them and things that push down. They're pushed up by environmental enrichment, by learning, right? Just think back about the amount of words that somebody is exposed to, the amount of environmental complexity. How complex is your environment? The more complex, the more of those neurons you're going to have. Sitting here today, you're going to leave with more neurons and they'll survive better because you learned something today versus if you were to sit in your home and watch TV. Physical exercise changes that. Right? So physical exercise is a very, very strong inducer of that. Every time you have a physical exercise, you see more of those cells born, you see more of those cells survive. And as I said, antidepressants push that up. What pushes it down? Aging. Not a lot that we can do about that. Jet lag. Maybe we can do something about that, but not a lot. Stress and glucocorticoids, the stress hormone cortisol, are very important for that. They are depressors of that. Is all stress the same? Is it always being exposed to stress something that is stressful? Well, I'm going to say no. This is one example that I might not have time to talk about right now. So we'll put it to the side, but just say social environment. Super important. We see some upregulation with stress, with a moderate stress, and a downregulation with chronic stress. So, but let's put this to the side for a minute. Those cells that we're talking about, those proliferating cells, turns out we found out that acute stress, moderate stress, some amount of stress, actually pushes up the, the generation of them. It pushes up the generation, and more so, it pushes up the activation of them and the recruitment into fear learning. And so with some amount of stress, you're actually doing better. This moderate stress pushes you to do better. The data that I didn't show you, the moderate stress pushes you to seek social support. There's a difference in a hormone in your brain called oxytocin that pushes you to seek social support that makes you remember better the fear and learn better later on. But when that stress becomes too much, then we see a decrease in those things. What we also were able to show is that that pushes those cells to create another line of cells. So again, I'll glance over the details, but just tell you that that change that we found, we could show the same thing in humans and in stressed rats, and that explains a lot of the individual variability. 
that tells us that when we look at a population, there's going to be individual variability. And the more of that change that we see, the more of the cells that are pushed away and making this other line of cells and creating myelin, the more humans are showing PTSD symptoms, the more rats are showing anxiety, a composite of anxiety symptoms. So starting to understand where resilience comes from and why giving the exposure to trauma, some individuals will do well and some not. We're at the beginning of those understanding. We really don't know enough about that, but it starts to give us a clue. One of the clue that we found was in collaboration with Darlene, looking at her rats that you just heard about, the high lichen and grooming, the low lichen and grooming. What happens to those neurons in those brains? This is one of the biggest differences that we've ever observed in animals, right? So we're looking here at the high lichen and grooming and the low lichen and grooming. Everything that's different is the amount of maternal care that they got in the beginning. And this is an enormous difference, right? And that enormous difference in the proliferation of the stem cells, in the proliferation of those cells that create myelin, in the amount of myelin that we're seeing, sort of can explain now trajectories and individual variability that follows them the rest of their life. We're looking here at adult mice that got different amounts of maternal care and are showing profoundly different brains at the end of it that are going to be much more vulnerable or much more resilient to stress later on in life. So we're now at the point in, in this project where we're working together to ask questions about mechanism, to look at what are the hormones, what are the neurotransmitters, what is the connectivity, what is the network process that explains those differences um, in social that I didn't show you today, uh, some of the work on cognitive that I showed you today, anxiety behavior, and trying to, and even put that to get towards the, the data that we have about traumatic brain injury and concussions and see how that can explain those different variabilities. It is something that I think is sort of optimistic in the world of that very pessimistic neurobiology of stress story, right? So we understand the biology of it and the biology of it is pretty depressing. That means there are physiological mechanisms. There are things that would happen and we can't do much with it. But the knowledge to me is very powerful. But it also says that there's a lot of plasticity, and it also says that there's a lot of context that we can provide to then change that. And maybe we get to the point with that understanding at some future, future uh, aim where we even know how to change that, when we know who's more vulnerable and how do we switch them on to the trajectory of resilience. Some things that one can take from that is there are literature to show that those types of interventions work. We know that mindfulness works. We know that physical exercise works. We know that positive outlook and gratitude look works. We know that control and sense of control work. And sense of control, that's an interesting one, right? Because it could be perceived control. It could be tools to, to, to decide where your control is in the situation. But a lot of those are tools that we can give the people that you guys are actually working with. Okay, so I'll end here. Thank you. I take hope uh, in some of the brain studies of folks who've engaged in long-term meditation who, um, and where they have actually seen changes in brain structure from that. Um, I, I always believe that there is hope um, because we see it in people. And uh, I always tell the people in the community that I'm working with that we as scientists are just catching up with what they all know already. Um, although the work that you guys are doing is just totally, literally mind blowing. <laughs> so um, so I, I'll be getting more cards from folks. So please uh, pass your cards forward uh, or over or whatever. Raise your hand if you have a card or a question you wanna share. Um, so, um, so one question, um, probably more for Daniela, is thinking about how physiological resilience factors um, can be proactively created in children before they're exposed to traumatic stressors. Yeah, so it, it's a fantastic question. Um, and it's one that I think about a lot. And I think um, we're not 
quite there yet, except for giving those general advice. So we, there are some things that we know, and then there's a lot that we don't know. And the understanding of, of resilience is really, it's an infancy. I, I've put up a, a paper, yeah. a recent paper in Nature, if you want to go and see it, 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 uh, it talks about Darlene's work, about some of my works, and other people that are doing things, but it's, it's the beginning of us understanding what resilience is. And when we will know more of that, I think we'll be able to even ask about changing and interventions and doing. But a lot of the things that we know about interventions that work for chronic stress are going to be similar. So I think that we have some tools now, and the deep biological understanding is what will let us move on to get more personalized tools, if you want, when you could actually look at a person and know, you know, they have uh, a deficit maybe in the myelin or in the neurogenesis or in dopamine or in, in address that specifically. Um, for Darlene, maybe, or either one of you just talking about... We uh, are mixed up often. Yeah, you guys are mixed up. So you guys <laughs> decide. I, I, will let you, I will let you guys decide. So uh, for the... Uh, um, for you guys as, as your axis. <laughs> um, can you speak to the impact of stress, cortisol, um, and obesity, and vulnerability to obesity and uh, related diseases? Yeah. So uh, I don't know where the, that person is coming from with that question yeah. because I, I can answer that in a lot of different ways. Uh, so obesity and, and adipocytes, which are just all our fat cells, are really metabolically active. So uh, the more that you have, the more you can potentially wreak havoc with a lot of these regulatory right. processes that, or accents, mm -hmm. <laughs> processes that Daniela was talking about. So, um, so we can think about obesity or a lot of adipocytes uh, really as a, as a chronic stressor. Okay. Uh, and again, when we're talking about acute versus chronic stress, what's interesting about the stress axis is that physiologically you can see that we, again, thinking about individual variability, that we go often in opposite directions, right? So some people actually uh, will increase obesity or fat stores and some people will waste away. Right. So it's fascinating that, again, this, this uh, central stress response allows us to go in both directions. Um, so uh, we can think about that as a chronic stressor uh, that sort of overlies a lot of, uh, a lot of already uh, sort of uh, endogenous processes. And the question becomes where that tipping point is. And again, because we're all so individually different, that tipping point is going to be different places and different spaces for all of us. Uh, I, have a, I have another different level of response to that, but that's sort of physiologically how I yeah. think about it. I think I, I can add sort of the molecular um, answer to that, but when you think about the fight or flight response, part of what you need is energy mobilized. So glucose have to be mobilized from wherever it is and be spilled into the bloodstream. Right. And that helps the muscle and it helps the heart and it helps the brain. Because you now have quick energy that you need. Now, you think about that in a chronic sense, this is a long time going. High blood glucose, we all know what it is, that's diabetes or prediabetes or a, a, a metabolic syndrome, right. an insulin resistance that comes with that. So chronic stress, very clearly on the molecular level can push you to that space. When you think about uh, the programming, just in the way that we talked about the programming in the brain, there is a metabolic programming. And the metabolic programming shows, and there's a lot of data and a lot of studies to show, that uh, malnutrition early in life, or in development, or in utero, or of the mother before she was even pregnant, changes the metabolic pathway in a way that you are now the offspring is now ready to conserve energy because energy maybe is not that available. So when we think about obesity, we never think about it as a good thing. But when you think about it from an evolutionary adaptation type of uh, perspective, if an embryo is growing up in an environment that tells him food is not going to be around, you really want to conserve energy as much as you can. And so you could think about it as an adaptive um, process. Now, when yeah. you follow just like Darlene did, two, three generations out of that, that still follows, right? And so there is this programming, fine-tuning of the metabolic tone that has to do with uh, your life history, your life history when you were in utero, the life history of the mother, the life history of the grandmother that affected where that is, and then chronic stress comes on, on top of that and will push towards uh, obesity that now is not an adaptive 
response. Right. Can, yeah. I, and I, can I just sort of jump on, in on that, sort of bringing it back to thinking about how we frame our questions and how we frame our perspectives and how we engage in all of this stuff. Angela Lee is an educator, uh, and I fell into some of her work, and she fell into some of my work, and I'm always impressed when people are willing to sort of learn this neuroscience to understand, uh, and she talks about um, framing our questions always from a poverty or a deficit perspective, yeah. right? And so Daniela's sort of response to that is a great way to think about how we can reframe this, specifically when we're talking about folks from uh, environments that are always labeled impoverished or less than or or not enough, uh, right. right? So, and again, sort of the, the broader cultural and social determinants influence that. Um, I have a very personal response to thinking about uh, obesity and fat and adipocytes and all of those things. I went through puberty and I gained a lot of weight and my entire life I've just been bigger than the average woman, whatever that is. Uh, I was raised by a fierce, you know, single mother and could give two shits about what the world says to me about my body, so I'm empowered enough, but I know that's not the case for, for many, many people. Mm -hmm. And as the science is being unfolded, I've had this level of understanding at a personal level that makes perfect sense. My mother mm -hmm. is this petite, nine, was 90 pounds uh, when she was pregnant with me. She doubled her body weight. So she, was, wow. I, she weighed 180 pounds wow. when I was born. And she said she was never under 100 pounds after I was born. <laughs> um, but she worked in a hot dry cleaners until the day before I was born. And she had one meal a day. She, had a, she ate a pizza for lunch every single day. So think about, and, and again, wow. sort of the, the science behind this absolutely was so powerful for me as a, as a person to understand this, but mechanistically. So in utero, uh, like metabolically as an embryo, uh, I am holding on to absolutely every, <laughs> every single bit every that comes my way. Every piece uh, of pepperoni. Yeah, and, and I knew there had to be some, some reason why I can eat a fraction of what other people do. And, and again, no judgment, but the power that comes from understanding that. And I think about that with respect to this stress work as well, um, and how how powerful and how robust my body is, right? right. Like, like this is this is survival, uh, and this is survival under really harsh conditions. And if you just look at me without any social or family context, you know, I'm a BMI, or I'm a, or mm -hmm. you know, or whatever we want to label it. But if you look, if you just look at that prenatal period, and then again look into to to uh, pre, pre pre pre, you know, my grandmother's. Um, uh, circumstances, uh, we get a much fuller, broader context. And again, I'm sure, like many of you, we've heard about thrifty genotypes, right? Mm -hmm. And especially mm -hmm. from indigenous or native populations. Um, and within my family, in our own, you know, one generation, I can see this absolutely play out. Um, so it's, I, I think, the same when we're trying to extract a lot of this sort of uh, stress, not sort of, but the stress information and take it back to vulnerable populations. These are populations right. that are surviving. Right. And there's a cost associated with that. And so when you get a chance to talk about that, it really is a reframing this, not from this deficit model, but, but we're surviving and there are costs associated with that. And, and nobody asked me, but there's still costs associated with that. Right. And I, I guess as a clinician, I'll let myself jump in a little <laughs> bit about chronic disease and just to say that so much of chronic disease is related to inflammation, which is a closely tied word to everything we've been talking yes. about and, uh, and is a physical translation of, of these stress responses. And inflammation is critical to uh, heart disease, is critical to HIV, is critical to, right. to so many factors. So that's another uh, bridge, just using different words for a lot of the same processes. Yep. Um, so um, I guess um, just getting back to um, thinking about uh, early on in life and later in life, uh, if these neural patterns are set on uh, set early on, can these patterns be changed? And what are your guys' thoughts about that? I, I'm waiting for somebody to ask that yeah, to show one graph. Really <laughs> <laughs> but as a good academic, that's what we do. Um, and again, when I started uh, uh, working with these models, I was. You know, uh, I quit at some point and I worked as a social worker and then when I went back it was to use to ask really selfish questions and so this is a nice schema of sort of what we've been talking about um, and and what I really wanted what I really cared about as a social worker though like I was working with kids in the system so uh, I'm from Montreal 
uh, and I'm from the poorest neighborhood in Montreal, and my, tr my training and background had all been science or biology or, or some of that. Uh, and when I started working for social services, all the kids in the system were from poor neighborhoods. Uh, and again, this is, these are lived experiences. I'm sorry, we can't see this slide. Oh. <laughs> yeah, those chatty women over there. Um, so, the, but the, the basic observations that all the kids in the system, and I didn't know anything about, so, you know, I really didn't. Uh, but all the kids in the system were from poor neighborhoods and disproportionately from my neighborhood. And I was in my early 20s and, you know, the kids in the system were the kids of my friends who had dropped out of school at 15 or 16 uh, and had uh, a lot of kids by the time they were 24 or 25. So I was working with kids from my own neighborhood. Um, and I would get the kids in after school programs or whatever and I'm still sending them back to the same crappy environments, right? So. Uh, that kind of, a, after a few years of that, that inspired me to go back uh, and design, again, exp an experiment that should be the point of all stress research, which is figuring out how do we affect change. So that's kind of that question. Um, and so this is just looking, I mean, it's sort of a busy slide, but looking at uh, uh, early development of manipulation, so uh, offspring raised in a low versus a high environment, uh, or we can call those handling. Uh, which is equivalent to a high maternal environment and maternal separation, which uh, is a low quality maternal environment. So these would be labeled our developmentally uh, resilient, robust population, and these are our vulnerable populations. Increased fear, increased anxiety, increased response to stress. And again, the first experiment I designed after uh, leaving uh, social work was how do we make things better? And it kind of picks up exactly where Daniela left off. Uh, and then rather than thinking about any particular thing, I just wanted the, the you know, read, scouring through the literature. So we used, I used this massive enrichment and it was everything that you can, everything that Daniela talked about. So it's social enrichment, more complex environments, uh, bells and whistles and toys and, and running wheels and we rotated those so the, so the animals never got bored. And this was after they were outside of this early developmental window, right? So again, these are the vulnerable rats that always have the worst prognoses. Uh, my, they're the population that, they're the target population that we're interested in. I used a massive enrichment for both uh, populations. And then what I won't talk about is the social, again, so leading from real life, often life doesn't get better. It stays crappier, it gets worse. Uh, and I won't tell you what happened to these animals who were socially isolated because it was, it's, it was the worst thing that I've ever done to animals, which was take a vulnerable developmental animal and then socially isolate it. It's the worst thing. Uh, I can imagine doing it. It's sort of like when Daniel shows you the, the adult brains uh, of uh, uh, rodents reared in different environments, that uh, if we uh, insult adult animals and deliberately uh, manipulate their adult brains, uh, that often doesn't even compare to these developmentally instantiated uh, differences. That's how profound early experience uh, is capable of influencing things. So uh, this, these were our vulnerable populations with respect to this uh, uh, particular open field task. So the maternally separated vulnerable uh, animals, so we food deprived them and then we put food uh, out for them and then these animals are so anxious that they can't eat. Uh, these are our protected populations, they do just fine. But the vulnerable population who we threw the massive enrichment at um, uh, absolutely recovered their, beha their adaptive behavioral profile. So, though, so we took this vulnerable population, we massively enriched them, and we did that at weaning, which is like early adolescence for, for these rodent models. So earlier, sooner, better, always. Uh, but you get what you get presented to you. Um, and then if we look at the integrated court responses, so again, these are the classic high stress response, uh, lower stress response in response to stress. The vulnerable population developmentally that we threw the massive enrichment at actually then had the lowest cortis corticosterone profiles. Um, we sliced the brains and we look at some of those early limbic areas that are early developing. We didn't reverse, so we predicted based on these behavior and hormonal profiles that we didn't reverse that, and we didn't. So my takeaway from this is that there's all, the, the opportunity to affect change is always there, earlier, sooner, better, exactly how uh, Daniela unpacked for you. And then this early adolescent period, again, is this incredible window of opportunity. Um, what we're doing is not reversing those early developmental effects. We're absolutely compensating for them at the level of the brain that then's popping up in behavior and physiology. Um, but those early developing limbic profiles are survival, right? So, so again, it's that change is always possible, um, and what the sort of the molecular underpinnings of that allow us to think in a more refined way about not reversing any of this, but how do we compensate? How do we 
how do we, uh, from an external perspective, how do we meet you know, kids where they're at to, to promote this phenomena? That was a long answer to a short question, but, but, that, but this is the point of doing this work, I think. It's really awesome. Yay. Okay, I'm gonna give you one last super easy question and not give you a lot of time for it, the two of you. So maybe you can each accents. talk uh, for, for a minute about this. Uh, so uh, where do you see your work intersecting um, given your talk about um, environments and social environments and well-being? Where do you see your work intersecting with social and political movements? I think it's kind of an interesting question and hard to answer. It is an interesting question. So, um, so about three days before the elections, the recent elections, which was the first one. What election? <laughs> <laughs> the one that never happened. Uh, the first time that I was able to vote in an American election, I just became citizen uh, right before that. So I was very excited. Um, completely oblivious and blind to what the outcome was going to be. Took me by complete surprise. But three days before that, I get uh, a phone call from the San Francisco, um, San Francisco Chronicle saying, would you write an op-ed about stress? Because a lot of people are stressed in these elections. <laughs> and we would like you to write it. And can you write it from a positive spin? Right, and so because um, our, my, my work is uh, sort of uh, new in the sense of showing that stress can have a positive effect. And so they're saying so many people are stressed, but don't tell them again that stress is bad for them, but can you tell about the positive things that stress causes? So that's easy, um, I can, and do it in 600 words. And so I, in 600 words, I can uh, put a course, a semester long course that I teach in Berkeley called the Neurobiology of Stress, where I said, there's some bad things, we're not gonna talk about them here, there's some good things, um, here are the... And then I saw the results of the election, and, it was, and I had uh, 12 hours before it came on press, and I said, can I change just a little bit? <laughs> I just feel like it's not really relevant, all this did it. And so I changed a little bit, and I put in things that said, you know, maybe stress can actually push you to action, and stress can get you activated, and, and we, you know, let, let's use the stress for a positive thing. So on. And it came online, and we got and a lot of... the phone number of your congressman. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and I got a lot of positive responses about that, and people that said that really helped that context. And I got an email from a student who said, I'm ashamed that in this place and time, you would say that stress has any positive effect and ignore the rest of the world. And I think that was an eye-opening moment for me. I think, uh, and, and she said, and you use that to promote your science. And then, ooh, like, I, I never thought about promoting my science. What do you mean promote my science? <laughs> She's really uh, bad at promoting her science, actually. <laughs> but, um, but I thought that, that was an interesting eye-opening moment to think, you know, that it is so complex. It is so complex, and you can take the, the what I think is the you know, clean message of, of biology, of science, just saying this is what the system looks like, to me is very powerful. It's, it's important to know. But then it can be taken out to the world and be interpreted in many, many different ways. And so that, wow. that's my long-winded answer. Dorothy, well, do you have? I, I'm more long-winded, I think. Uh, so I'll make you not be okay, more long-winded. Uh, you have one minute. I, <laughs> People are going to have their, their I, hunger I, stress response. I really like working with animal models. Oh, I really, I'm, I'm so like loud in life. Our microphones scare me. Um, not really. Uh, I like, I love animals, but I, I like what we can say from our uh, animal models to establish these causal relationships because I can tell you can see I mean so I, I mean the evolution of my uh, experimental design is really as I'm trying to figure out how this works in the world really from my own perspective and every time I think okay I've convinced people with this data there's another yeah but there's always a yeah butter, right? So all of this rat work, which is so profound, and we publish it in big journals, and then people said, yeah, but what about genetics? So then the next experiments I did were using identical animals, and then still, and then the geneticists were upset because now they have to study life and not just genes and all those things. <laughs> yeah, butter. So, no, people, got, I, people yelled at me at a, you know, I'm a, a trainee at a poster, and I didn't get it. Like, I didn't get what I'm asking them to relinquish, which is 
they, you know, they've spent careers and lifetimes investing in identities and things and stories. So if you can be egoless about this, and you don't, and Danielle and I are <laughs> to the, you know, so egoless, um, and if you don't care about credit, I think, and you can work with people, there's incredible opportunity, which is sort of how we've been going through this. And for me, I just agreed in the School of Public Health, to the irony that I'm now an administrator, I agreed to be an associate dean for education, equity, and inclusion. Um, and it matters, and I'm like, a, I'm a nice bully, but I'm a bully, right? So I kind of get my way. Um, but we've done work with low SES Berkeley undergrad students here, that I, again, the people I love stressing more than the animals. Uh, but again, for, like designing these experiments from my perspective, going, what does it feel like when you're a, a poor, you know, you come from a poor background and family and you're at a place like Berkeley um, where you're constantly feeling less than and, and the faculty don't get it because that's usually not them, <laughs> right? Like sort of my colleagues are still pretty white, pretty privileged, lovely human beings. Um, I should, I should not. <laughs> <laughs> First, yeah, yeah. We, we have aberrant, uh, yeah, Danielle has dropped out and taught yoga and all that. We have aberrant, sorry. Um, no, but lovely, so, so I spend all of my time, and it is infused by, by my own data, um, like how do I reach these, like how do I reach these people? So we have data from our low SE, our poor students showing that if we do a true social stress test, public speaking is the worst thing you can do to a human being. So we do this in our high SES students. All the things I can throw at them doesn't perturb, it doesn't perturb much, right? They're pretty resilient. Our low SES students, when the minute that I make it evaluative or we make it uh, socially challenging, uh, even though baseline, everybody can perform equivalently. Uh, I uh, layer social evaluation on our poor students and their uh, measures of inflammation go up acutely within minutes. Um, um, their stress hormone profiles go up and their performance uh, on these academic tasks tanks, even though I know that baseline everybody's the same. That same population of students, if, I pro if we provide them with social support, then much like this red group there, have actually the best academic performance and prognosis. So I spent all of January and February now um, going to all of our admissions committee meetings, talking to my colleagues about like this. So, so my favorite students are these students. Yeah. Like these are the students who are gonna change the world, who often have nothing left to lose and everything to gain. Um, and the, the students who work in my research lab actually are a very bimodal distribution, right? So, um, and I, I feel so lucky that I get that here and that maybe Stanford doesn't get that or Harvard, you know, but I get that here at Berkeley. Right. So when I get frustrated with administration, I feel grateful for the students that we have. So uh, I'm using our basic research findings now to influence the composition of the, you know, the, the students in our School of Public Health. And, uh, which is, which is what Jeff was talking about, extraordinary teaching as opposed to just excellent teaching. Oh, so, uh, sure. Yeah, you're, you're, <laughs> I'm just a bully. You're walking the, go, you're walking the bully, walk, teaching the walk. Back, I go back to the, uh, you know, our, our office, and I, and I think, I, like, I hope I'm on the side of good because some of the stuff that I pull, <laughs> like on, to, to, to broader the greater good, which is like, you would have to work hard to convince me that diversity doesn't make us all better. And not because it's the right thing to say, but based on evidence. Right. Absolutely, it's the right thing.